It's the holidays. A lot of people have a lot of activities this month. Praise God. Our theme for this month has been 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. So I'm going to ask us to read this again. So let us read this again. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. This is our theme verse for December. Amen. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 9. Can we read this together? For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Amen? Amen. Christians are wealthy. Amen. We're not, we don't have to desire to be wealthy because we are wealthy. Amen? The most important message that God wants us to have is for us to recognize what we have in Christ. We have so much in Christ. Amen? And let's just invite you to the prayer of Paul in Ephesians chapter 1. I want you to read verse 17 to 18 to remind us what we have in Christ. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 17 to 18. Listen to this. I keep asking God that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, will give you, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. You know what revelation means? In this context of Paul's epistles, it refers to illumination to help us understand better the gospel. Revelation in this context means illumination to help us understand better the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To give us wisdom, the ability to understand and apply whatever is about to be revealed to us. The ability to understand and apply what is about to be revealed to us. The spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. The most important prayer request of Paul is for us to know Jesus more. Because the more we know him, the more we understand who we are and what we have in Christ. To know Jesus. He said to know him better and then he begins to amplify on that. He begins to explain what does it mean to know Jesus. Look at verse 18. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know can you say to the person beside you that you may know maybe you don't know yet can you say to the person beside are you sure you know <laughs> that you may know know what that you may know the hope Whenever the Paul says hope is talking about what God is preparing for us. Everything that God is preparing for us, which will be fully unveiled when we see Jesus Christ. What God is preparing for us, that you may know the hope to which he has called you. You were called to what? The riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. Who of you here have a very rich father and you're expecting a very big inheritance? I like those hands who went up. They know their father. They're talking about their heavenly father. <laughs> Amen? You have an inexhaustible and glorious inheritance. Amen? And that inheritance is eternal. It's not temporal. It's not something you enjoy only in this life. Because everything in this life is passing away. You cannot bring anything from here to there. Everything here is temporal. But the wonderful thing about God's revelation is that part of that inheritance we are about to receive, we are experiencing now. And we can experience now. But it is only a foretaste. God will not give you everything in this life. You know why? Because whatever he gives you in this life stays here. Remember our life on earth compared to eternity is like, just like a drop in an ocean. Amen? And God is preparing us for something bigger. Amen? Something more lasting. The riches of his glorious inheritance where? In the saints. Who are the saints? 
That's you and me. Paul addresses Christians in his epistles as saints to the saints in Philippi, to the saints in Corinth, when he addresses his letters to them. We are saints because saints miss those who have been set apart for God. And those who are set apart fulfill God's purpose for their lives. Amen? Are you set apart? Yes. Amen. And saints are those who grow in their likeness of Christ. The more we become like Christ, the S in the saints grows bigger. You got the point? Okay. But we are all saints, still in the process of being holy, but we have been set apart for God as his possession. And so the word of God says that God's riches, the riches of his glorious interest is in the saints. Are you sure you have it in you? Yes. How do you know you have it in you? Because of Christ in you. It is Christ in you who is the guarantee of that inheritance. That's why he says in the saints. He doesn't say the glorious inheritance for the saints. He doesn't say for the saints. In the saints. You already have it. And Christ in you, in the person of the Holy Spirit, is your guarantee that you already possess it. You are already wealthy. Amen? Amen? <laughs> My God open. That's why Paul said, I pray that God will open your eyes. Whenever you see you have little money in your wallet, you see with physical eyes, but you don't see with spiritual eyes what you have in Christ. That you know because God's inheritance, His riches is already in the saints, you can be sure that need is already guaranteed to be met. That's sure to be met. Amen? Amen. God's way, God's time. Amen. But the riches of God is already available for all of us today. The inheritance is in the saints. Can you say, in the saints? Yes. The guarantee of this glorious inheritance is already in me. That's what Paul meant when he said, Christ, though he was rich, became poor, so that through his poverty, you might become rich. That wealth is already ours through Jesus Christ, who is in us. Are you still here? Amen? For some of you, Christ in that sounds very familiar. But we need to understand that in the proper context. Amen? So Christ in you, the hope of glory, He is the one who guarantees that you receive that hope where you re receive that glorious inheritance that God has prepared for you and part of those blessings already being given in this life. Hallelujah. And to meet all our needs. There is nothing that you receive in answer to your needs that is not already yours in Christ. I keep repeating this to you. Whatever you receive is already yours. It's already guaranteed for you. Hallelujah. Amen. Never doubt what God can give you. Don't think small. Jesus said, according to your faith, it shall be unto you. When you have a wealth so inexhaustible, it is so, you call that, it's so myopic, they would say, to think, to wish only something very small. You understand that? When you are doing God's work, every need of that ministry has already been supplied in Christ. If God gives you a vision, you know that the provision already fits the vision. The important thing, what is God saying to you? So I cannot say, Lord, I want to think big. I want three houses. I've got five cars, you know. That's not how you use that. Okay? God will release those resources when you pursue his purpose and will in your life. Everything that God releases is in line with his purpose and will for your life. When you're running after his purpose, you can be sure nothing is impossible. The important thing, what does God want you to do? When you find the answer to that question, you begin to pursue that purpose of God. 
whatever the need will be, no matter how big the vision, no matter how great the need, God has already supplied that. It's just a matter of time. Because you're moving in the direction of God's will. Amen? God's resources is primarily reserved and preserved to fulfill His purpose for your life. Amen. The most important thing is obedience. Jesus Christ, though He was rich for our sakes, He became poor because that was the Father's purpose for Him. Remember the first Christmas night? Where was Jesus born? The manger. Born in very poor circumstances. The poverty of Christ from birth up to his resurrection is a strong rebuke to the materialism of our age. And sometimes the materialism of Christianity. Jesus was born poor, lived poor, and died poor. As I told you, he had to be buried in a borrowed tomb. And Jesus knows how to return what he borrowed. Three days later, he returned it back to Joseph. Amen? He, he had nothing in this world. He had no bank account. In fact, the only bank account he was, was in the hands of a thief, the treasurer of the twelve, who ensured that there will always be a need. Why? Because he's always stealing from the treasury. Do you understand that? I told you last week, remember? Why would Jesus appoint a thief to be the holder of the money bag, money bag of the twelve? Just John chapter 12. What's the answer? I mean, Jesus never rebuked them. He said, you Judas, you're a thief. You keep stealing from the money bag. Don't do that. Never hear Jesus rebuking Judas. But everybody knows he's been stealing from the bag. You know, from the gifts of the people to Jesus, he's the one who keeps the money. And Jesus appointed him. <laughs> Amen? It's like putting money in a bag of holes. How many of you feel that? Some that, Lord, you bless me, I put and then it's gone. How many of you experience that? It's like putting money in a bag of holes. <laughs> Come on, be honest. <laughs> You know why? Because God wants us to remain humble and dependent on God. And now you will understand the secret of true wealth today. It's that Jesus became poor so that he might impart wealth to others. Did you hear that? Did he possess everything? Did he possess everything? Did just Jesus possess everything? How come he became poor? He became poor so that the wealth that he has, he can impart to you. You understand that? Because Jesus wanted to remain simple. He wanted to live a humble, dependent life. That's why he never held a bank account. He never stored treasures on earth. Because he wanted to remain humble and dependent on his Father. This is God's purpose for us. That's why when God blesses you materially, the Word of God says, Paul says in 1 Timothy 6, for godliness with contentment is great gain. He's saying real wealth is not in having much. Real wealth is learning to be content and maintain your obedience to God in the midst of much. Real true wealth is not having much, but maintaining contentment and godliness in the midst of much. Are you still here? I want you to hear this. Real wealth, true wealth in God's eyes is not what you hold in your hand. Real wealth in God's eyes is what you have inside of you. And that is the love of Christ for people. That is true wealth. 
There was a time some years ago when two great women died. One died in an accident. And one, another great woman died, I think, because of illness and old age. But the focus of the media world, world's media was on the uh, popular woman from the West who had so much. It was only later that the focus started to go to the one in the East that had nothing. You remember those two women died in the same year? Can you tell me the one in the West? Princess Diana. The one in the East? Mother Teresa. One, the embodiment of wealth, prestige, and power. The other, the embodiment of poverty, self-sacrifice, and absolute obedience to God. In the kingdom of God, which of the two women will be greater? Mother Teresa in India. Why? Why do you say that he will be greater in the eyes of heaven? You see, Princess Diana gave out of the wealth that she has, surplus. Mother Teresa gave everything. Nothing left for her. Remember this in the story of the widow's offering in the temple. Jesus said, True giving in heaven's eyes is not measured by how much you give away, but by how much you have given up. True giving in heaven's eyes is never measured by how much you give away because it's easy to give and you have so much. But how much you have given up is what is measured by heaven as truly great giving. Remember that widow? Jesus compared her with the wealthy who gave out of their surplus into the temple offering. And this widow gave only two coins, all she had to live on. And Jesus said, look at this widow. All those wealthy people gave out of their surplus, but this woman gave all that she had to live on. She gave the greatest in the eyes of heaven because she gave up. Are you still here? Who is truly wealthy in both, between the two in heaven's eyes? It's not Princess Diana. It's Mother Teresa because she gave up everything for the cause of of the kingdom in ministering to the poor of India. Are you still here? Yes. Mother Teresa, although there were so many donations of charity to her work, never took hold of those money for her own benefit, but gave everything to the poor, and she remained poor. Not only because her vow as a nun because nuns have three vows, chastity, celibacy, and poverty. And obedience to God. Listen to this. Jesus Christ became poor. He gave up everything to die on the cross for you and me so he can give us everything. That is one of the central messages of Christmas. And he did that out of obedience to God. Are you still here? Don't try to seek wealth or power. Seek rather to obey God regardless of the price. Because when you obey God and His purpose in your life, you will never lack. But it is no guarantee that you'll become wealthy. Obedience to God does not guarantee that you will be wealthy. Because God may have a purpose for you like His Son, Jesus Christ, for you to remain poor so that your poverty becomes a testimony to the world of God's faithfulness. Amen? Do not interpret blessing as material. In heaven's eyes, the greatest blessings are intangible. The blessing of God's forgiveness. The blessing of your reconciliation with God 
was at the price of the life of the Son of God. The greatest blessing God has given you and me is not money. It's Jesus. His own Son. Sacrifice for you. That is His greatest blessing. He gave you the most precious one to Him. That is your greatest blessing. To have Jesus is to have everything. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. That's why godliness with contentment is great gain. Contentment because you already have everything. You have Christ. You have everything that money can never buy. Money can never buy peace. Money cannot buy love. Money cannot buy real joy. Money cannot buy security. Money cannot buy success. Psalm 127 one says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchmen stand guard in vain. In the end, success and security are gifts of God. Gifts of God's grace. Because no matter how hard you work, if God's favor is not on you, you have no guarantee you will reap your desired results. God's favor is not on you. You understand this? Amen? Everything is about God's grace. And that grace has been given to you because of what Jesus did. Amen? True wealth is not what you have in your hand. It is what you have inside of you. And that is the love of God. The love of Christ. To have Christ in you is true wealth. Amen? Because He grants all your needs. He grants even your heart's wishes. Amen? Walang sinabi po si Aladdin. Hanggang three wishes lang siya eh. I feel pity for that figure in that story. He only has three wishes. God's people have unlimited wishes that can be granted. John 15, 7, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you wish. He said, you will ask whatever you need. You will ask whatever you wish. And it shall be given to you. Because when you abide in God, so when you obey God with all your heart, even your wish becomes God's command. Are you still here? But it does not guarantee that you're going to be materially wealthy because if that's not God's purpose for you, it's not going to happen. If God's purpose for you is to be wealthy, nothing can stop it from happening. Are you still here? Amen. It's about obedience to God's purpose, whatever it is. In the end, what lasts for eternity is not what you have achieved in this life or how much you have gained in this life. What lasts for eternity is how much you have obeyed God. Everything is about obedience. Now listen to this. You know in the story of Job, right? How many of you are obeying God because you want God to bless me? Everybody suddenly, oops, I'm not that one. <laughs> How many of you are obeying God because you want, because you know that if you obey God, you'll be so blessed? Let's be honest. It's okay to be honest and it's also okay if that is corrected today because it will be corrected. You are righteous because you are already wealthy in Christ. Again, what does Paul say? I pray that the eyes of your heart be light that you may know the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints. 
You're not trying to be righteous because you want to get more. You're trying to be righteous because you love God, period. Don't try to be righteous because you want to get some more. How can you have some more when you already have everything in Christ? If you just obey God, it will come. It will come. Every vision always has a prepared provision. The important thing, follow the vision of God in your life. And nothing is impossible. Testimony of Esther Renewal Ministries. When we obeyed God last 2012, we just obeyed God. We don't know how we're going to do it. But we just obey God. And as God bless and prosper the ministry, yes. Oh, glory to God. And maybe very soon we will have our envisioned building. Probably within two to three years from now. God is moving. So many surprises. When you obey God, you're never out of surprises from God. We don't seek righteousness because of what we can get out from God. We seek righteousness because we love Him. Period. Not because of what you may gain. Paul said godliness with contentment is in itself already great gain. Amen? Amen? Well, the story of Job. Let's take a look for a while at the story of Job. How many remember Job? How many remember Job when you're going through a lot of pain and suffering? Okay, but did you ever understand the message of Job? We often think, ah, Job's story tells me this, that if I suffer right now, if I remain faithful to God, God will give me back double what I have lost. Right? That's what Job's story tells, assures me, right? Is that the main point of Job's story? Job's story comforts me because like Job, if I suffer a lot, I will gain much. Because the Lord restored twice of the property that he took away from Job because he allowed the devil to take them all away. Was that the main purpose of Job? I maintain righteousness because I'll get more. Job chapter 1, verse 8 and following. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. I wonder if God is saying that about you and me. There is no one on earth like him or like her. Is God saying that about you? We don't know. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. That's a de description of the righteous. How does Satan reply? Does Job fear God for nothing? Are you saying God to me that Job is maintaining righteousness simply because of being righteous or because he's expecting something in return. Listen to what the devil says. I pray that the words of the devil is not true of us. Have you, have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything? You have protected all the blessings you have given him. His family, his property, his servants, his wealth. You have protected. Wow, isn't that wonderful? When God blesses you, he can protect those blessings so that the devil cannot seal them. God can do that. Hallelujah, amen. And this is exactly the Satan's great criticism. God, how can he not be righteous? I mean, you always bless him. And you don't even allow me to touch his blessing. And remember something about Satan here. Satan's job is to steal and to destroy. When God gives you something, Satan is committed to take that away. But thank God for his protection. 
Hallelujah. Amen. And so he says, oh, you know, God, I don't think you know him. I think I know him more. Okay? You have blessed the work of his hands so that his flocks and herds are spread throughout the land. I mean, you really protect everything so he continues to increase and increase and increase. That's why he's righteous. He's righteous because he wants those blessings. But stretch out your hand and strike everything he has and he will surely curse you to your face. How many Christians after they suffer loss of jobs, property, begin to make tampo with God. How many of God's people, once they lose their securities on earth, begin to get angry with God? And then they stop being righteous. They backslide. They turn their backs to God. Bitter. Why did you take him away? It only proves Satan was right. Satan was right about us. Are you still here? Stretch out his, your hand and strike everything he has. Come on. You don't allow me to do it. You do it. Come on, you stretch out your hand. Strike everything and it will curse you to your face. You do it. You don't allow me anyway. Are you thankful to God that God is protecting you? Yes. And every blessing he has given you? Yes. Hallelujah. But there are times God will remove the protective barrier in order to find out why are you righteous. The Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has is in your hands. I will not strike my blessings, but I will allow you to do so. Are you still here? God refuses to do it himself. What he has given to bless is blessing. Amen? But I will allow you to do it. Everything he has, he has in, in your hands. But on the man himself, you don't touch him. Wow. Are we protected? Yes. God can take away, God can allow Satan to take away everything we have. But God protects our life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Now listen to this. On the man himself, do not even lay a finger. All that finger will be cut off. And so what happened? Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And then one day when the sons, Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys were grazing nearby, and the Sabaeans attacked and carried them off. They put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who escaped to tell you. One paragraph at first, all, he lost all his donkeys and oxen. Second report, the fire of God came from the sky, verse 16, and burn up the sheep and the servants. Nothing left except the reporter. And verse 17, the Chaldeans formed three reading parties and took away your camels, all of your camels. Camels are the most expensive media of transportation in ancient times. More expensive than the horse. You know why? If you buy a camel in their time, it's like buying a Mercedes Benz 2014 edition. That's how expensive they are. A person's wealth is often measured by how much camels he has or how much horses he has. Horses are next expensive. Do you know where camels are more expensive than horses? Horses run out of water because of so much speed. They cannot travel so far. Camels can travel farther than horses. When it comes to long distance travel, you'll prefer a camel to a horse. You'll prefer more sustainability rather than speed. You understand this? All the camels, the most expensive transportation, were all taken away. It's like losing a lot of your BMWs and Mercedes Benzes just one swoop. And your, your what you call that red car? 
your Ferraris. One swoop. Okay? And the worst in verse 18, his children were celebrating in the house of the eldest brother and then suddenly a mighty wind swept from the desert and, you know, east wind is a very powerful wind that can bring down even the very foundations of a house. It's like a tornado. Okay? And it hit the four corners of the house. It collapsed on your children and all your children are dead. Thank God your children are alive. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Because God's protecting them. Never stop to thank God for protection every day. All of their children are gone. And Satan said, now the moment of truth. Come on, Job. What will you say? Ha -ha. If Job focus on the devil, you devil, how do there you did. I rebuke you. He never talks about the devil. Comes to God and recognizes that the devil can do nothing unless God allowed him so. And so where does he go? He doesn't go to face the devil. He goes to God. Because without God, the devil can't even do that to you. You go to God and seek his purpose. Don't go to the devil and run after him and kept, you know, hitting him. Because he's going to hit back. Go to God. The devil does not deserve even a second of your attention. He's nothing. He cannot do anything against you unless your father permits it. And if your father permits it, you go to him. Not to the devil. Do you understand this? Listen to this. He goes to God, tears his robe in the traditional gesture of mourning and shock he mourns he's grieved he's human he cries out in pain it's not stoic but truly human tore his robes in grief and mourning fell to the ground instead of saying instead of cursing god he said Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will depart. The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. That is truly a righteous man. Amen. Hallelujah, amen. And yet today we hear so many messages that say, Do this, you're going to be rich. God's going to bless you, bless you materially. How sure of you? That's God's purpose for your life. Obedience is no guarantee you're going to be rich. But obedience definitely guarantees that at the right time in God's way, you will be rewarded because God promised it. But not in ways you necessarily want. The one who rewards has the prerogative to decide what kind of rewards he will give. Are you still here? So when we are blessed with material things, do not allow those material things to, begin, to become a condition for your relationship with God. Because to have Jesus is to have everything already. What more will you ask for? When you have Jesus, what more will you ask for? Everything he holds in his hands. Whether he gives you wealth or poverty, because it will please him to fulfill a glorious purpose through your situation in life. Your faithful trust and obedience will bring great honor to him and will carry out his purpose in your life. Hallelujah. Even Paul, he gave up everything, but he never became rich materially. In fact, he said, in Philippians chapter 4, I've learned to be content whatever circumstances I am. Whether rich or having nothing, whether suffering, lack or having abundance, I've learned to be content in everything. Now let me deliver to you the most important point now. Listen very carefully. Let's go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And this is very important. 
2 Corinthians 9, we are reminded in verse 6, Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves. You know, when you give cheerfully, it shows, you know why God is so touched by a child of God who gives liberally and cheerfully? Because it reveals that he is not attached to his material things. It reveals he truly loves God and is willing to give away even the material. Because he is not attached to the material things. There is no love of money in his heart. There is no dependence on material things for his security. Where your treasure is, Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will also be. You cannot serve both God and money at the same time. You can only have one and only one. God or money, there is no end. There is no both. You can only have one. You will love the one and hate the other. You will be devoted to the one and you will despise the other one. Are you still here? When you give cheerfully, it, it honors God because God sees you have no material attachments. God sees that your security is God alone. God sees that your wealth is God alone. That's why God loves a cheerful giver. He loves a cheerful giver. Amen? You know, you cannot be a cheerful giver if you're dependent on material things for your security. In fact, you cannot fully obey God when your security is based on material things. Your, your, your attachment to material things will be your greatest hindrance to complete obedience to God's will. God doesn't please God at all. Because we forget that God is the greatest treasure. Not those things. Are you still with me? Just one more verse before I go to the ending. Take a look at Genesis chapter 14. I want you to see an example about where true wealth is. The king of Sodom said to Abram, Give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. That means Abram just rescued this people of Sodom, including Lot, his nephew, and his family, Chapter 14 of Genesis, okay. He rescued Lot and all the people of Sodom that were taken as slaves by five kings of the east who invaded Sodom and Gomorrah and took away everything, including the people. Abram was so concerned because Lot, his nephew, was one of those captives. So he mustered his army, ran after the five kings, and defeated them was able to retrieve Lot and all the people of Sodom and all the wealth of Sodom he was able to take back. And so when the king of Sodom saw him, the hero, he goes to Abram and said, okay, Abram, just give me my people or else I have nothing to reign on. <laughs> I am a king. Without my people, I am not a king. Give me all the people and keep all the wealth to yourself. It's all yours. What would, what would you say? Well, <clears throat> I deserve that because, you know, I, I defeated the kings of the east and you were not able to defeat it. I'm bringing you back all that your people. So I think I deserve something, right? That's not, what, that's not Abraham. Keep all the wealth of yourself, all the booty of the war, all the wealth of Sodom that he took away. It's all yours. Just give me my people because I need people to reign on. Okay, listen to this. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord. That's swearing. That's taking an oath. I have raised my hand to Yahweh, El Elyon, God Most High, creator of heaven and earth. And I have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abram rich. I'm not going to take anything from you, king of Sodom. Nothing from you. In fact, Abram anticipated that the king of Sodom will do this. 
and he already prepared himself by making a vow. I will not even receive a thong of his sandal for bringing him back his people. Did you hear that? Would you do that? You're offered billions for something good you have done. Wow, how tempting, right? Billions for something good you've done. You deserve it, right? No. You know why? Because Abraham is not seeking an earthly reward. He is not seeking an earthly reward. You can see that the heart of Abraham is not attached to material things. You can see the heart of Abraham does not base his security on his material possessions. He says, no. You will never say you made Abraham rich because my security is God and God alone. Are you still here? You know, God was so honored by that that in the very next thing that happens, chapter 15, go on. This is the next verses. God was so honored. Now listen to how God responds to a man like this. And you will never forget what you will hear. See, Abram did not seek any earthly reward. So what will God give him in return? Can you guess? Can you guess what God will give him in return for not taking earthly rewards? Huh? You can imagine God will give, Abram, I'm gonna bless you, bless you, bless you. With so many things. Because you prove again that I am your security. Is that what God said? No, look. Take a look now. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your very great reward. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> It's something that God, because of that heart, because of that heart that will not accept material rewards, because of that heart that doesn't seek earthly things, because you're proving again, Abraham, that all you love is no greater than myself. Because you love me, and you make me your only security in life. I cannot but respond to you. I'm not going to promise you I'll give you everything. No, that's even small. Abraham, I'm so honored. I'm giving you myself as your very great reward. Are you listening? It's not about material things. Don't be deceived that if you keep on giving and giving, you'll get more material things. That's not the objective. That's not the motive. You give because you love. Period. Expect nothing in return. Jesus said, lend to those who ask from you. Give and do not expect anything in return. And your reward will be very great. In the Gospel of Luke. Are you still here? God never wants you to put your security in what you have in your hand. That's never God's purpose. God wants you to put your security only in Him and in Him alone. Do you understand now? Now listen, I'm coming now to the conclusion. Going back to 2 Corinthians. Now you will understand what Paul is saying. Verse 7. We said, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. When you are reluctant or compul under compulsion, that means your heart is too attached to that money that you're about to give. And God says, I don't like that. Better not to give. Better don't give to me. Because I don't want you to be a hypocrite. If you give because you love me. If you give, it's because you know I am your security and I am your great reward. If you give, it's because you know that I am committed to you, to all your needs. I am your security. If you don't give that way, don't give. You'll just insult me. Are you still here? 
and God. When you're giving materially and God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things and at all times, did you hear that? Next verse. If God is your reward, what can you expect? <laughs> you have everything. Christ in you. The guarantee of your glorious inheritance. Hallelujah. Who is poor here? Can you raise your hands? After hearing this message. Anybody poor here? Now listen carefully. Able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, did you hear that? In all things, in every area of your life. In all things, at all times, all the time. You see all the all? All grace, all things, all times, all that you need. Did you hear that? Everything is all. Collect those alls. They are promises. In all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in all, also in the Greek, all good work. God gives you all grace in all things at all times so that you have all that you need, so that you will abound the purpose of which, the goal of which, is so that you will abound in all good work. What's the good work in chapter 10? Giving. Giving to those in need. You know, Paul wrote this epistle, especially chapter 9, to raise funds for the poor of Jerusalem. Because when he met the apostles in Jerusalem, Galatians chapter 2, when they extended the right hand of fellowship and recognized he was truly an apostle called by the same Jesus that they walked with for three years and saw him rise from the dead, they recognized that he truly is appointed of Jesus and has preaches the true gospel. They extend the right hand and then the leaders in Jerusalem said, Paul, only one request we ask of you as you minister to the Gentiles. For we recognize that your calling is to preach the gospel to the Gentiles while we preach to the Jews. Please don't forget the poor among us. And Paul never forgot that instruction. Ever he went in the Gentile church, he will soon collect money and send them to Jerusalem to the poor. You know why there are many poor in Jerusalem? Because when they became Christians, they lost everything. They were disinherited by their parents. They lost all their property. They became poor because of their faith in Christ. And Paul was committed to meet the needs of those poor brethren by soliciting from the gentle churches which God used him to establish. Are you still here? And listen to this. If you do this, if you give, to the needs of your brothers and sisters and give cheerfully. God is able to make all grace abound to you in all things at all times, having all that you need so that you will abound in all good work. That means God blesses you and meets every need so that you will be generous to others and to the work of God. Look at the next verse. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. Jesus himself, the example, his righteousness endures forever. The word righteousness in the Old Testament and the New Testament is a relational term. It means faithful love to your neighbor regardless of your circumstances. <clears throat> faithful love to your neighbor regardless of your circumstances. And righteousness is here revealed by giving to the poor. Next. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase. Remember this? That's our message last Sunday. What's the main point here? When God blesses you with much, more than you need, what's that for? The seed. That's not for you. God supplies you with bread. Bread is what is given to meet your needs. Give us today our daily bread. Jesus teaches us to pray. Bread is God's provision for all your needs. Seed is God's provision so that you can sow and give away to others so that God can bless you back. Are you still here? Now, most, there are many preachers who use this to say, you see, God's gonna make you rich. 
if you keep giving and giving because God is able to supply and increase. Right? Now, God's gonna enrich you not so that you'll have much more bread and more than you need. He will supply and increase your... You know what store is? That's where you stuck it's a storehouse right God didn't say I will increase your storehouse of bread that's not what John God said God will supply and increase your store of bread we're going to be materially rich no you will always have Enough for your needs. The rest is seed. They're still here. God never promised in this New Testament teaching of giving that He will enrich your storehouse of bread, but He will enrich your storehouse of seed. And as you give, remember the preceding verse. God's righteousness is shown by giving to the poor, by scattering gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He said, if you keep giving like God, then you will enlarge the harvest of your money. Yes. Is that what God promised? If you keep giving and giving and giving, God will enlarge your storehouse of seed so that you can seed more, so that you will have a harvest of wealth. No, the harvest is righteousness. First Timothy 6, godliness with contentment is great gain. Are you still here? This is how God manages the economy. If every material blessing you receive, you see them as old bread, the rich will become richer and the poor gets poorer. Are still here? This is how God manages the economy. The more you have, once you have everything you need, the rest is seed. You give them to the poor so that the economy is balanced. The problem why there are so many poor people is because those who have see everything as bread. For them. All for them. The other extreme is to see everything as seed, no more bread for the family. All ministry. That's another extreme. It should be a balance. Bread is for your need. When all your needs are met and you have more, you know what that's for. That's seed. And as you share that seed, God will multiply your storehouse of seed so that you'll be generous all the more. You know why? Because God wants the wealthy to live simple lives. God wants us to keep uh, God wants to keep us humble and dependent that even if you have much wealth, you remain poor in spirit as Jesus said, and you are blessed when you are poor in spirit though you have so much material thing, yet you remain dependent on God. Then the kingdom of God for there shall be the kingdom of God. Are you still here? Wealth is not for you. It's for God's purpose in the world. Don't take the seed as all bread. One day, you will lose all that bread if you do so. Because you're stealing from God's economy. Imagine if all the wealthy here follow this divine principle. What do you think will happen to the poor in the Philippines? They recognize bread for us, for the companies, it will keep running. The rest, seed for giving to the poor. Do you think we still have a lot of poor people here? This is God's economy. Do you agree with God? But what is hindering this is greed and the love for money. It's the love of money and greed that is 
coming against God's economy. As Ecclesiastes 5 says, he who loves money never has money enough. Never has money enough when you love money. Are you still here? So what is the message here? The reason why God allows you to keep on giving away. And just stick with the bread for yourself and your family and your business, whatever you have. But don't take everything as bread because one day a curse will come on that bread. Masisira yung bread na yan. Because you're trying to hoard it for yourself. Just like in the Exodus, when the Israelites took more manna, that is enough for a day because they wanted to have more for tomorrow. What happened? Nasira yung manna. Because it's only meant for a day. Contentment. Dependence. Trust in God every day. Give us today our daily bread. It doesn't say, give us today our annual bread. Or our monthly bread. God wants us to be dependent on Him every day. That's why if we have so much wealth, and you know that this is seed not for me, you will remain dependent on God for your bread. That's how God balances everything. Amen? We love God, that's why we're righteous. We love God because we obey Him. Whatever the results may be, we leave that to God. We don't dictate to God, God, I give, you give me more, okay? I'll be righteous, you bless me more, okay? I want three houses, five cars. God will never satisfy greed. But we will always bless abundantly the humble, dependent heart. Humility and dependence, a broken and contrite spirit, you will never despise. The skips ourselves humble. As we close, so many of you, whenever you have a material blessing, you're surprised that after that comes a test. Have you noticed that? When you get material blessing, something happens that begins to threaten your blessing. Can you raise your hands? I want you to raise it high. You experience a material blessing, the next thing happens, there's a problem, a big trouble that comes or a big challenge that comes. Come on. Everybody, you know why? Because God doesn't want you to base your security in what He has given you. The test that comes is intended to humble you and to put you back where you belong at the feet of God. It should never glory because of those material things. How many of you experienced a victory in the ministry and then anything that happens, something bad happens? Come on. Wow, we had successful ministry here and there and then boom, something happens. Come on. I've been receiving texts from people all over. Pastor, pray for us. We just had a great work in the jungle, I mean, in this place, in this place, and we had an accident, or you know, something, you know, something happens in my family, you know. Victory is such a, a sensitive thing. Because whenever God you victory in the ministry, you can be sure something is going to come that will humble you. Because when you remain humble, you remain useful in God's hands. When you become proud, God will put you away. Amen? Will you welcome those trials that come after material blessings come? Will you welcome them? Anyway, you have no choice. <laughs> they will come. Because God wants to keep you humble and dependent all the time. Hallelujah. Amen? Kaya pag tayo, nakaroon ng victory sa ministry, huwag kayo masyado, wow, 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 wow. Don't say, wow, wow, wow. Say, God, thank you, Lord, you're awesome. You know, oh, give all the glory to God. Kasi kung hindi, He will have to do something to humble you. Don't wait for it. The glory is God's alone, not yours, the glory about. Hallelujah, amen. Have you learned much today? What is the key? The grace of God was revealed when Christ became poor. Humility, dependence on God is the greatest wealth. Humility and dependence on God 
and love for people is true wealth in God's eyes. True wealth is not what you have in your hands, but what you have inside of you. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Lord, we thank you. You have given us something the world can never give us. You have given us your Son, Jesus. The hope of glory. The guarantee of our inheritance. But more than that, Father, you have given us your heart and all the love of your heart. And Lord, we will be righteous for no other reason than because we love you. We will give for no other reason but that we love you. And that, Lord, we can recognize that you are our security. And you are our very great reward and our shield. Thank you so much, Father, for bringing us back to where we belong, to your feet. Humbly lifting you up, humbly depending on you, and recognizing that you alone are God. Lord, forgive us for all our material attachments to this world. Forgive us, Lord, when we base our security on our bank accounts, on our material possessions, failing to remember that you own all these things and we are simply stewards of them. That in the end, we cannot carry these things beyond the grave. And Lord, we remember, Lord, now how you measure our love and that is by giving. As you, loved, as you loved us, O Lord, and gave us your Son, Jesus, you showed your love by giving the most difficult thing to give. You gave your Son, Jesus. And now we understand that in your kingdom, Father, the true measure of giving is not how much we have given away, but how much we have given up. And Father, this morning, we desire, O Lord, to show our love for you by willingly detaching our hearts from every earthly security that poses as a rival to you in our lives. We spend so much time and energy running after these things and yet so little time to run after you. Father, forgive us if our perspective and values have been distorted by the materialism of this world. Bring us back, Lord, to our place of worship. Bring us back to the place of humble dependence on you at every step of the way. And recognizing, Lord, that though you may give us much materially, we remain poor in spirit because we know nothing is ours. Everything is yours. Father, I pray that you will create in our hearts a hunger to keep on giving. Because we know therein is the greatest expression, Lord, of love for you. And that our security is you alone. Father, we ask your forgiveness. Lord, for allowing material things to take your place in our hearts and minds. And we're coming back to you. For you are the source. You alone are our God. We want to love you and to obey you. Give us hearts of obedience. No matter what happens, we will continue to be obey you, Lord. Even if you take away these blessings from us, we will remain obedient to you. Because we love you. We give you all the glory. Through your son, Jesus. Amen.